And my first question to you is, if you can just start off by telling us a little bit about what made you write this book, uh, what were sort of some of the main goals and themes that you wanted to accomplish or highlight, and perhaps a little bit about the process of researching it. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the questions and for the warm words. And I'm, I'm glad you felt that the themes um, and events explored are relevant beyond Ecuador. Um, because one of the big challenges as a graduate student writing the dissertation that became this book initially was kind of proving to the discipline, as it were, to, to my committee, to, you know, other, other, um, uh, in other settings and conferences and things like that, that a study of conflict over large scale mining in Ecuador was political science, right? And, and, and the reason that was a challenge was Ecuador not considered a geopolitically important country uh, in, in comparative politics, right? And not often studied. There's actually not a lot of scholarship, relatively speaking, on Ecuador in, in English. Um, mining, interestingly enough, there's not much of a history of political science studying mining. Um, oil is like the main kind of primary commodity that, that, that is studied. Um, and my book relates to oil quite a bit, but the original dissertation was on mining. And then um, the ethnographic methods and the attention to discourse also were, you know, at times, you know, I had to defend them, right? And so I say all of that to say that a study that is ethnographic of Ecuador around conflict over mining and indigenous movements could, you know, read in political science as like a very particular or ideographic, you know, kind of uh, study. But I, th I think the actors on the ground and hopefully my narration and analysis as well, make clear that these are broad global issues, right, that are just unfolding in a specific place and time, just like all politics do. Um, and that that sort of relates to my motivations initially for writing the dissertation and then writing the book that that it uh, was the foundation for, which started before uh, I knew I was going to graduate school, really, um, which was a, an extended period when I lived in Ecuador in 2008 and intentionally was there to sort of witness and participate in, in various ways, the um, wave of changes around Latin America at that moment, right? So I was in 2008 was just shortly after Correa, uh, Rafael Correa, Ecuador's left-wing president, that's a key actor in the book, um, uh, came to power. It was during the time that the constitution was being rewritten, which is the subject of a couple of chapters of the book. And I came there knowing that this was a momentous moment. And I came there also knowing that um, there would be interesting interactions between movements and the left-wing government. But I didn't expect two things that really prompted the book and, or you know, later prompted the dissertation and then the book. One is how central the politics of extraction, territory and indigenous rights, I should say the interlinked topics of resource extraction, uh, indigenous rights and indigenous territorial sovereignty would be to how, um, to how this sort of moment of left governance unfolded, right? That those would be the main nodes of conflict. That was not immediate, that was not totally foreseeable from the outset at least. Uh, and then the other thing that was not totally foreseeable was how conflictual the relationships between movements and the state would become. We had a couple of countries in what scholars call the pink tide, this moment of a lot of left-wing governments coming to power at roughly the same time in, in Latin America around the turn of the millennium. We already had Chavez in power and Morales in power. And if I'm not mistaken, Lula in power. And there's probably a couple of others that had, Korea wasn't the first, right? You know, there were other governments in surrounding countries where the left had already come to power in this exact same political trajectory. Um, and in those contexts, uh, I don't want to say that there wasn't conflict or tensions between movements and the states, because there were, and I could get into that if interesting, but they weren't, it, antagonism wasn't the primary, um, and polarization wasn't the primary dynamic. Whereas in Ecuador, from pretty soon into the Correa administration, especially starting in 2009, with the passage of a mining law that was very contentious because it was seen to overly um, open up Ecuador to large scale mining from the perspective of, of social movements. From very early in his administration, he entered in Korea, the government, a very antagonistic relationship with movements that not only were the historical reason for his rise to power, like there would have been no opening for the left without decades of social mobilization, making the case to Ecuadorians that neoliberalism was not you know, serving social needs and, and that it needed to be replaced with something else. So movements are part of the political opening, um, but also more approximately movements and their members and, and to a degree leadership supported, you know, if critically or with a little distance, his election initially and some of his initial 
um, um, moves once in power, especially the move to convene a constituent assembly, which was a long stand to rewrite the constitution, which was a long standing movement demand. So it wasn't immediately obvious. And I want to sort of preserve a little bit of that sense of surprise and contingency. Like it wasn't immediately obvious that movements would uh, enter into direct conflict with the left wing government that they had initially supported and that the sites of conflict or the crux of conflict would primarily be extraction territory indigenous rights as a sort of you know meta kind of uh, area of concern and so that that unexpected um, those unexpected outcomes which I had the luck of sort of witnessing firsthand because I was there at the moment that they began to unfold was like first rocked my own worldview like oh I never realized as you said in your own question like how how much there could be tension within the left over these particular issues, right? Um, and then um, I, I think I also did not expect how conflictual the relations would be. And that felt to me that, you know, on the one hand, Ecuador is what we might call in political science an extreme case, like, you know, really extreme in terms of level of movement state conflict for the, within the left. Um, but on the other hand, it felt like emblematic or like sort of dramatized tensions that were that exhibited more latently or, 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 you know, less dramatically in some neighboring cases. And, and I'll just end, you know, here by saying what I think that Ecuador dramatizes is precisely as you put it, the dilemmas and difficulties and trade-offs when the left comes to power, specifically in the peripheries of the global of the world system, let's say, the, the, which involves additional constraints on their room for man, political room for maneuver. Um, though I actually think that as we talk more and more about climate politics and environmental politics in the left around the world, including in the global north, that actually some of these dilemmas will become familiar to us as well, right? And in many ways, the global south can in some ways be seen, I think, as a vanguard of like where the general global order is heading, right? And, and I think is, is very important to study and pay attention to for that reason. So conflicts like those that developed in Ecuador, I think are actually proliferating not only across the global south, but actually within the global north as well. That's great, thank you so much. And I'd love to return to some of those broader implications, um, perhaps towards the, the end of our discussion today, although I promise to keep it under 30 minutes and I, I already sent you a list of questions that could take us on for a few days. So I, I'll, I'll try my best to, to, to limit them. But there's really so much uh, to cover in the book because it's really incredibly rich. And so, but with that said, I'd like to sort of talk about some of these social forces and, and tensions within Ecuador. And specifically, um, your book traces what, what you label and what others have labeled the emergence of extractivismo as a grand narrative of resistance out of the disputes that emerge within the left that you referred to, specifically with the Korea administration. So can you talk to us a little bit how this narrative and critique actually emerged uh, uh, during this period of time and, and, and you know, what were and who were the social forces that were articulating it and what did it really come to signify to them? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. And it, it, I think brings us back to a couple of the themes that I mentioned in the first answer which is to say one of the things that I, the goals that I had in, in presenting extractivismo or extractivism as this particular mode of critique and of set of associated um, uh, militant movement tactics. Um, one of my goals was to show to readers how novel it is without denying that it has historical roots. I'll come to those in a moment, but as a sort of overarching theme of resistance, it was new. And the reason that was important for me to show uh, is that I think that, um, you know, we often get trapped in the present and have kind of amnesia. I mean, this is a typical human thing, right? And forget that things used to be different. And, and I think, you know, what, what, is, what is amazing to me is not, so not just, I should say, the, the kind of um, uh, pillars of this discourse and its tactics, but also that it was a big shift for movements, right? And to sort of note as social, as I think very sophisticated work on social movements in, in, in sociology and, and anthropology and political science has shown that movements, tactics, discourses, stances are context dependent. Not only are they context dependent, but they can shape the context, right? There's a di dialectical relationship there. And so I really wanted to bring that out. And so, um, 
prior to the uh, embrace of, of a sort of anti-extractive position, which was a position of outright opposition to any project deemed, quote, extractive, primarily um, primary resource extraction, oil and, and mining, but also certain forms of agriculture, monocrop agriculture, um, uh, kind of agribusiness, that, that type of agriculture, um, and, uh, and also um, uh, mega development projects, right? So things like dams, hydroelectric plants, right? So any large scale project that fundamentally alters the landscape and that potentially could have environmental impacts or social impacts, right? That is what uh, ex extractive sectors are and what the extractive, um, uh, anti-extractive movements took aim at. But what is interesting is that there, the embrace on the part of movements of this anti-extractive position was a shift from their prior position, which had been less critical of extraction um, uh, to court, let's say, extraction itself, and more critical of the form of ownership and the distribution of economic benefits and also the modes of labor exploitation associated with it. So what we could say is that you know, in the 1990s and early 2000s, the indigenous movement, uh, labor unions, uh, urban neighborhood groups that, that organize kind of working class people in their neighborhoods, all of these kind of popular movements, uh, their fundamental critique of the history of extraction in Ecuador, which has been an oil dependent state since 1972 um, and also extracts and, and harvests other primary commodities for export, their primary critique was that the profits go elsewhere. The profits go to foreign capitalists, right? Um, or their domestic allies in the ruling class, right? The um, ownership is often foreign as well. When it's even state ownership, there's not enough worker control or worker influence over it, right? Um, and, uh, and that the terms of trade were often unfair and uh, against global South countries. And this is a longstanding critique of, of you know, the position of commodity exporters in the global economy. So they had what we might call like classical left and also anti-imperialist uh, critiques of extraction, right? That are familiar from the early 20th century uh, uh, from actually the age of empire onward and also especially during the anti-colonial movements of the 60s and 70s that really updated these critiques for, for the late later in the 20th century. Anyway, so familiar critiques, Marxist we might call them or we might call them, you know, to be a little more precise, actually like revolutionary nationalist or left nationalist critiques, right? What, what happened with the election of Correa, who I already mentioned was made possible by these decades of social mobilization around things like let's we should nationalize oil so that it benefits the people. What happened when Correa got elected is a, a, a sort of nuanced set of shifts occurred. Correa embraces rhetorically and to an extent in policy practice, some of those resource nationalist demands that movements had espoused for a long time. Correa agrees with them. He agrees that extraction has not benefited the Ecuadorian people. He agree, He's a left technocratic economist. He agrees that extraction provides opportunities for redistribution that were not taken advantage of by neoliberal elites previously. Um, and he agrees, he also thinks that the state can change the relations of power between with foreign capital so that the state has more control and asserts its sovereignty. So he he kind of takes up several of the key themes of the resource nationalism, um, uh, radical resource nationalism that movements had espoused, though it's less anti-capitalist. So it's important to note that he waters it down, but he, you know, he, he validates it in certain ways. And so then movements are in this odd position. They're like the person in power is kind of um, taking up our discourse, though not quite as radical as ours is, what do we do? And this is just an interesting moment to just pause and point to these are the types of tensions within the left that arise when a left government comes to power. It, it, it changes the context and the um, logic of, of like of left wing social mobilization. Do you target the state as an enemy as you used to do when the right was in power or is the state a collaborator? How do you relate to a state that shares some of your values, right? Um, but what movements did was actually pretty quickly change their whole um, critique and analysis of extraction. And what really prompted them to do that, in addition to Korea coming to power and him kind of taking up some of their, their previously articulated concerns, was that he um, made it very clear that he was going to expand extraction to new areas and new sectors. And that specifically, he was going to institute the era of large scale mining, which he did in Ecuador, that was a new extractive sector in an oil dependent, already oil dependent country, and that he was also going to continue the historic push that other presidents had also uh, um, 
attempted to bring oil extraction into parts of the Amazon that it didn't currently, um, you know, hadn't, hadn't previously existed. So what that means concretely is that communities, in most cases, but not exclusively indigenous, were going to confront uh, extractive sectors that they had no prior experience with, they did not, they were not used to, they did not accept, and, you know, they had pre-existing livelihoods and notions of what to do with their territory that did not include intensified extraction, right, um, or wholesale removal as mountaintop, you know, open pit mining often involves, you know, displacing entire communities and having them move elsewhere, which occurred in Ecuador under Korea. So, um, so in that context, they're like facing this left government, but also one that's expanding extraction. And it is then that moment in a very creative and actually rapid set of shifts, they begin to zoom in on extraction as the primary ill, not the mode of ownership, not how exploited labor is, not if it's foreign capital or state domestic ownership, but rather extraction itself is the root of our problems. And actually extraction and extractivism or extractivism inflects uh, the pink tide, these new left governments, as much as it did neo prior neoliberal governments. And so it's a critique that is actually aimed at the left for not breaking with the extractivism that had been, we could say, instituted in the colonial era 500 years ago, or, you know, and, and, and really intensified uh, uh, during subsequent eras, including neoliberalism. So it, it, what extractivism is, is a militant critique of extraction that was born of a very particular conjuncture in which the left came to power and simultaneously the left intensified and expanded extraction responding to a global commodity boom that, that incentivized the expansion of extraction because the prices were so high. Um, and I'll end here. You know, I think it's important to see what's at stake and what the tension is for anti-extractive activists Extractivism contaminates the environment, violates indigenous rights to their livelihood and territory. It also has this tendency in their view to centralize political power um, and to have these state corporate alliances that are just bad for democracy, right? So that's the anti-extractive critique. The pro-extractive left-wing stance is we need to take advantage of these high prices for these commodities in this unusual moment of a commodity super cycle uh, that lasted almost a decade and a half, um, starting in 2000, in order to address immediately the unmet needs of the population for food security, housing security, health care, um, uh, you know, a basic income, all of those, all of those um, um, pressing needs and a very high poverty rate when Ecuador, when, when Korea came to power in Ecuador, the most immediate way to address those was these revenues coming in from oil and mining. And so you can see the tension, the different left goals and the different emancipatory, um, you know, uh, ideals and, and goals at, at stake in these different, uh, different forms of leftism that existed in Ecuador in tension. And what I like about the book is that you really, um, I mean, you have a wide range of interlocutors uh, and, and in addition to your archival research, but through this, you really allow the reader to see these tensions emerging in a way that is, um, I mean, you're not the dispassionate political scientist, you're fully committed and involved, but you're also, um, you know, allowing these movements to really represent themselves uh, in, in the way, in, in terms of how they're grappling with it. And, you know, you also interview uh, people within the Korea administration who are conflicted about these issues. They, they yeah. see the problems, but they also mention how, well, it's not practical for us to suddenly switch and stop extractivism. We need to phase this out over maybe 25 years. And really you see there some, you know, some difficult practical questions that, that you, uh, you sort of wade through and, and you walk through and, and you allow the reader also to sort of think about, particularly uh, by, by, um, um, sort of taking on their national development plan and, and sort of showing uh, the different tensions around that. But there's another set of tensions in addition to that, that uh, actually in addition to that economic question has a broader uh, implication, which is the democratic question. What does it mean when we say democratic management of resources? Uh, what does it mean to have consultations with the communities who are more directly involved? And this becomes a uh, a, a big uh, source of, of tension and back and forth between the Korea administration and uh, Perez, I think, who is one of your interlocutors, who uh, uh, is one of the presidential candidates uh, today, I believe, as well as other people that, that you interview, um, on the question of 
uh, you know, who gets to decide over mineral extraction and what does it mean for communities who are affected? And there's this really interesting back and forth that you highlight in the book about this question of who are the people? What is the demos here when we're talking about democracy? Can you talk to us a little bit about that and perhaps also help us draw the maybe the broader implications that we have of this very important question, you know, in, in terms of thinking beyond simply just Ecuador, which is very important. And I, I want to ask you before we end, hopefully, about the um, the current presidential election. But um, talk to us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Sure, of course. And I, uh, I agree. I'm glad that you pick up on this as a central question and one that is more generalizable, which is this question of uh, you know, the age old political question, really, of who rules, right? Who has decision making authority in a given space and time and, and, and setting, right? And the democratic variant of that question um, is, it, uh, which is also quite old, uh, is, you know, who are the people and what are their powers, right? Because uh, democracy, demos, you know, uh, the Greek etymology, the idea is that the people rule, but that actually, as many democratic theorists have, have pointed out uh, um, um, from Aristotle to Francia, right? I mean, theorists of, of democracy, like that, the, that the, the question of the demos is a question, right? Right? It's not clear who, who that collective subject is in advance. And oftentimes in democracy, especially actually in this age of populism, we might say that we live in, the, the conflict centers on how the people are de defined. Uh, and, and what's interesting in the case of, of, of Ecuador, and this I think has a lot of implications for elsewhere in the world, is that the, the definition became partly about scale and territory and, and physical boundaries in a sense. And, and that um, shouldn't seem shocking to us, right? Because uh, a very simple container for the demos is the nation state and its boundaries, right? And, and so this is a familiar notion that we have territorial boundaries to the people. But what I think there are certain contexts under which those territorial boundaries become tense and fraught and themselves the, the subject of, of, of dispute and the reason that they do in Ecuador, and this recurs around the world, including in, in, in the US um, uh, where, where, where I'm speaking from, is that um, resource extraction, which is the really the, the foundation of, of capitalist production, right? You can't have the production of commodities without raw materials um, that are extracted or harvested from the earth in some way. Um, and so when we look at the foundations of capitalist production and those that first phase of any commodity, uh, we see that resource extraction is very unevenly distributed spatially. Uh, and that can be often for reasons that are not in human control, right? There are specific geological deposits of oil or, cer or certain minerals, right? There are climactic conditions that are favorable to agricultural sectors, right? And so these are area, these are what scholars call nature facing sectors they they you know they come up against that interface of, of humans and, and nature and by that reason there are some dis, you know distinct characteristics and the key one that i'm zooming in on here is that there is a what i call in the book an uneven territoriality of extraction and it's it's uneven for the reasons i just said um but it's also uneven in another sense that's politically charged which is that because extraction takes place in particular places, um, uh, in particular territories, there are some communities and ecosystems that pay the kind of cost of extraction more so than others, right? And so there's immediately a question of justice and of democratic justice that arises, which is if a community lives near the site of oil extraction, of mining extraction, of fracking, of uh, you know a mega soy farm with its environmental impacts. Like, uh, do they have some special rights uh, or decision-making power over that project since they're the ones that will bear whatever social and environmental harms are generated? And they may not be the ones that immediately economically benefit from it, depending on the ownership, on how the revenues from it are distributed, et cetera, right? So there is this this kind of um, disparity between who pays the cost and who might benefit from the extraction. And in the case of Ecuador, and again, just a, it's an example, because I think, as you say, this is a global question. Um, the, the way that the benefits and costs were distributed under a left-wing government were interesting. The costs were still quite um, uh, locally born, uh, like certain communities were literally displaced from their territory or faced the contamination of oil in their, in their watershed or whatever it was, right? 
And but what what the Korea government did was ensure as much as possible, and he actually made a lot of headway in doing this, that the benefits went to the majority of the population as much as possible, rather than be just um, uh, hoarded by like foreign capitalists or, you know, by, you know, go outside the country in some way or just benefit the shareholders of these companies. He was intent on redistributing the economic revenues that the state collected to like low and middle income Ecuadorians, right? So what you had was a tension between the fact that in urban areas, let's say, where the majority of, of people live, A of all, and B of all, where a lot of you know lower and middle class people live with, with the social needs that I referred to before, those people may be far away from the immediate sites of extraction, but they saw improvements to social services, to public infrastructure, to their own well-being um, and, and human development as a result of these revenues. Meanwhile, there were specific communities which also got this received this redistribution as well, but who really bore the cost, right? And the cost was not offset by the redistribution because, you know, if, let's say a hundred dollar, a hundred and fifty dollar monthly cash transfer, which I don't want to downplay because if you are poor, that is a very significant amount of money. But anyway, uh, you know, it can be a significant improvement, I should say. Uh, so, but that cash transfer may not make up for a loss of livelihood, for an inability to pursue the agriculture you previously did, for the contamination of your waterways, right? For the wholesale displacement and forced removal um, to another area, to the destruction potentially of sacred spiritual sites, right? If we're talking about indigenous communities. So there were, there, the, the costs felt existential, feel existential, I should say. And that's what sets up this question of who should decide. And the way that it played out in Ecuador, which again is familiar across the world because these relate actually to international rights that many countries are party to um, and international norms and conventions. Uh, the way it played out was through this question of consultation. Um, and I'll just say briefly that uh, in various international conventions, indigenous communities and other affected communities are directly affected communities are supposed to have the right to be consulted by firms or and or states depending on the situation prior to any extractive activities that can affect their livelihood environment or territory. And Ecuador is a party to multiple conventions that says this, and it's in their constitution, their very progressive 2008 constitution that I mentioned earlier. And so movements basically were clamoring to you know, claim this right that existed. And they felt, um, and I recount, that the government did not substantively enforce the right to prior consultation. So what they did, another example of movement creativity is that they began to self-enforce it. They set up consultations, right? And what's very interesting, and I'll just end here, and this brings us actually to the present and to um, the anti-mining leader Perez that you already mentioned, who was a candidate in the Ecuadorian elections, um, it, to the very present. So in the book, um, I, in chapter four, I go through a self-consultation that a community organized that Perez played a big role in because he was um, head of the community water association that carried out the consultation. Fast forward to the present and the um, uh, a city actually, um, uh, Cuenca, the third largest city in Ecuador that is quite near to that mining project in question, uh, and so that's an interesting little deviation, because in this case, you do have a city near the project, which actually helps the movement be stronger because urban people are involved, but I'll put that aside. But the city, the, the residents of Cuenca recently voted in a official government consultation that they won through a petition, they won the right to consult, uh, that they don't want m mining in their watersheds, right? And that means that, that the project that years ago I witnessed and I recount in the book, that a community self-consulted itself because the government didn't do the consultation in their view. Now, many years later, um, it, the, the, the major city near that project has had an official government recognized consultation that says no mining projects that affect our waterways. And that throws into question like any additional new mining projects that might be planned. And so these tactics that, first of all, the issue of democracy, the issue of consultation, the issue of who rules, they're just growing in prominence as different communities, including those that don't aren't right next door, but are just you're know, in a neighboring city, are taking up their democratic right to have influence over policymaking. And I think it's a really interesting development that, by the way, has all sorts of implications um, for climate change, which also introduces a lot of these questions of justice of who is most affected and who actually has decision-making power versus who is 
culpable and responsible and complicit for the problem in the first place and you know but also has you know more decision making power than the than the most affected frontline communities so there's a lot of you know places where we can see these types of conflicts that's great and that really brings me to the last question which has to do with the current uh, runoff elections so uh, andres arauz uh, and guillermo lasso i believe are going to be uh, competing in the runoff election um, uh, Lasso, after having, um, uh, I guess, beaten Jaco Perez or having Garen more votes, although that was contested or there was some objections to the results from Perez. So um, Arauz, if I understand correctly, is seen as a continuation of the Korea administration policies or at least approach, but maybe you know, you can help us understand the current moment, maybe some of the dynamics that are taking place right now in terms of the elections, you know, without predicting necessarily what might, sure. might happen, but, you know, you know, who are the different forces and, um, you know, in, to what extent has the, the indigenous movement um, weighed in on this election and where do you, where do you see things going perhaps? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I will not predict because things have already been taken multiple unexpected turns just in the past few weeks, right? So I think no one is is predicting things. Um, I um, um, uh, so just to to give some background, we're in the second or some context for those not familiar. Uh, and you know, we'll see when this video launches. So we might, I'm sure, we'll know more by the time people are watching this. But um, uh, right now, um, we are in March, we are on March 1st filming this. And so the situation is that a few weeks ago, there was a first round of elections. If someone had outright won that first round, there would have been no second round. However, that did not occur. There, um, uh, Andres Arauz, who um, is the perceived kind of Koreista or Korea candidate, meaning he is close to Korea, he plans to continue Korea's um, political project, though with changes and nuances. And I don't, I don't think they're the same, but you know, it's, it's that, it's that legacy that will be brought kind of forward into the future. Uh, Arauz got the plurality of votes, but just shy of getting enough uh, votes to just win outright. Okay. And then there was the question of who will he go off against in the second round? Cause it's just a two person second round. Right. And it was um, uh, uh, unclear because the initial count that was like 97% or something, don't quote me on that, but you know, it was a high percentage, but not a hundred percent made it look like Yaku Perez, who is featured in my book, as, as noted, um, would be the uh, second place candidate. And that actually, you know, shocking to me, even as someone that studies these things, the two leftisms that I display in my book would be the two on the ballot, right? We would have the anti-extractive left and a quite prominent anti-extractive leader, um, indigenous leader um, um, from the Southern Highlands, where this has been a very contentious issue. And then um, on, on the other side, we would have, you know, some rebooted version of, of Koreismo, of, 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 um, of the pink tide left populism, right? That did not end up occurring um, to Perez's disappointment. Um, he also alleged that there was fraud. I'm not sure that the, any international observers had found evidence of this, you know, but, you know, obviously his right to, to, to claim that. Um, and, and so there... There, there was a moment of of, un, of of lack of clarity. There were a few percentage per points points worth of votes to count and recount, and uh, they ended up stopping short of an official like recount that would have recounted a lot of the votes because they couldn't, I guess, find evidence of fraud. They did recount some ballots that maybe had some questionable attributes or something, but in the end of the day, Lasso beat out for second place Perez, and who Lasso is is a right-wing banker, and this will be his third run for president, first two unsuccessful, of course. And so this will be a much more classic right-left, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, match, um, rather than a left-left, let's say, or, you know, anti-extractive versus left populist um, uh, match. And, um, you know, the forces are, uh, are a little complex. Um, uh, um, let, let me start with, I'm, I'm just trying to think, because actually, oddly enough, there's some overlap between the sources of support for these different candidates. So Korea, um, or I should say, for Korea side, sorry, Andres um, Arauz has um, a lot of support 
in the among working class Ecuadorians, particularly strong on the coast, actually. And that was an interesting change because the coast used to vote more conservative, including working class um, uh, voters. But it, it Korea managed to kind of flip the coast, as it were. I mean, like we talk about flipping states in the U.S., right? So, so that that's an achievement of the Korea government. Um, but what the Korea, but that, what that was somewhat at the expense of, let's say, or what the Korea government lost significantly in its time in power is um, indigenous votes from the Amazon, um, from the Southern Amazon that were increasingly alarmed both by the anti, well, excuse me, by the extractive policies, by the mining and oil projects I mentioned, but also I think even more than that by the criminalization of protest against those policies. So even if you didn't have a strong environmentalist viewpoint, you were not happy that the state military was coming in to like protect a mining project from indigenous protest, right? So, so those, Episodes of criminalization and state repression really soured the the southern and indi southern Amazonian indigenous voters against Korea, right? So he won, you know, Korea kind of expanded his coalition in some ways, but lost it in other ways, and that looks to be repeating with the current election. So we have Arauz, um, um, as I said, with the with a very strong showing on the coast, but also elsewhere, uh, especially among working class voters. We have. Um, uh, Perez picking up a lot of the indigenous vote in this, especially in the South, Southern Highlands and Southern Amazon, but also picking up a lot of young voters that consider themselves to be environmentalists, right? And then Lasso is like basically picking up conservatives where it gets, and those are distributed across the country and by class, of course, you know, more upper class voters. But what, what is going to be interesting is how much Lasso can pick up Yaku Perez's votes, right? How much voters that are motivated by anti-extraction and um, indigenous rights um, would rather vote for a right-wing candidate than someone on the left that they associate with extractivism, right? And that is a choice that voters will have to make because I can't, I maybe didn't even emphasize it enough earlier in this interview, but the debate between Korea and movements got so polarized that um, movements that otherwise and, and individuals would support several of Korea's policies just became very anti-Korea because of the di polarized dynamic, right? So we will see how this all plays out. I think Arauz has a very good chance over Lasso because Lasso is much more right-wing than like the median Ecuadorian voter. Um, but we'll see if, I mean, there could be some scenario in which Lasso gets uh, weirdly, like the votes of an anti-extractive indigenous leader, the Lasso is neither of those things, just because they're anti-Korea, and that that brings him into more um, more likelihood of or more kind of like a, a tighter race with Arauz, right? So I think those are the dynamics that we should look out for. I will say that it strikes me that you know while one might want, and I think um, you know one might want, let's say I'll put it to be kind of diplomatic, a little objective. One might want. Arouse to break a little bit more clearly with some of what I think were Korea's real errors around criminalization and around just the promotion of extraction kind of at all cost. Arouse has broken with some of Korea's and the Korea government's like policies and approaches, right? So I think he is more um, open to actual dialogue with movements rather than just, you know, hating anyone who criticizes him. I think he understands that the party um, uh, needs to institutionalize itself more in its social bases and be less leader centric like it was under Korea. And I think, you know, he's a, another left wing economist. And I think he probably brings some interesting heterodox ideas about how to manage the economy, especially in this moment of crisis. So I think Arauz is his own politician. Uh, I think maybe a more a clearer break from some of Korea's um, problems or errors would be maybe advisable in, in sort of my opinion, but also just for electoral, you know, for getting votes. Um, but I think that that this will be a very interesting left-right dynamic that, cert that if Arauz wins, will really make it difficult to argue that the left is over in Latin America, the pink tide is over, right? We had the recent victory of in, in Bolivia um, of the left, um, in Argentina prior to that. So I think it becomes increasingly difficult to argue as it kind of seemed momentarily in around 2014-15 that the right was going to make a full comeback in Latin America. I think it's much more open question and Ecuador's election is just another indication of that. Well, thank you so much. We'll keep an eye on that. And uh, hopefully, maybe after the election, we can revisit some of these issues. Uh, thank you so much, Thea, for speaking with us. I highly recommend everyone watching really go buy your book and read it and really grapple with some of the really important questions that it raises. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Omar.